Uh, the next talk for 30 minutes is going to be on uh, acute aortic dissection. Um, we're going to go through the talk in the form of four cases, um, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the epidemiology um, beforehand, and then we'll talk a, a little bit about the characteristics of dissection and, and how to diagnose it and how not to miss it. So um, here are the things you should remember about aortic dissection after this talk. So limitations of chest x-ray, we'll talk about that. Classification of dissection, relatively simple. The reason why it's important, most classifications don't matter that much, but the reason why this classification matters, it relates directly to management. Um, and then related to that management, how and why you need to control the blood pressure and the heart rate. That's really important. And then a lot of people have asked us the role of D-dimer in evaluation of aortic dissection. Used to be not so great, now it's gotten better with a few important clinical principles. I think it can be very useful. Um, one of the things that I like to do as an educator, um, and I found that this was very useful, is anytime I needed to grapple with a subject that was tough to remember, I used to go around teaching people. So um, really, any, anyone who came by, so medical student, resident, other physicians, which I'm attending physicians, which I'm sure they love me for, you know, the janitors walking by, it's like, hey, have you heard about acute aortic dissection? Let's talk about it. And the reason is, is actually something very simple is, is when you teach someone something, First of all, they're going to probe your knowledge of it to the point where you don't really know it as well as you thought you did, and it goes back and makes you relearn it. Second of it is the more you repeat something verbally, the more it cements down in your brain. So if you're actually teaching someone these things, you will remember them a lot. So teach someone the limitations of chest x-ray the next time you, you meet them. Teach someone the classification and how it relates to management. Teach someone why and how you need to control the blood pressure and the heart rate. And then teach someone the role of D-dimer. I think the teaching process itself benefits the learner, certainly, um, but even the teacher, maybe even, uh, maybe even more than the learner. So just a, just a quick note on that. So let's go through these cases. Case number one, 54-year-old man, chest pain radiating to the back, diaphoresis and vomiting, history of hypertension, and the EKG is normal sinus rhythm, no ST elevations, no ST depressions. So what are the historical clues that help us diagnose acute aortic dissection, and what diagnostic testing needs to be done? So this is a table modified from the IRAD data that's a big data registry. And this is showing the prevalence of symptoms in acute aortic dissection. So I'm a big believer in that if you know the most common things that happen, you're going to get less tripped up on missing uh, you know, the diagnosis here. So the most common thing is pain 96% of the time, which makes sense, right? Aortic dissection, very painful condition. Um, the thing that bothers me about that is 4% of dissections are painless. That's really painful to deal with, right? Is how can you diagnose dissection when there's no pain? It's tough, but what can you do? Severe pain or the worst pain ever. Uh, almost 90, over 90% 90 of patients have that. Abrupt onset of pain, so very sudden pain. Almost 90% of patients have that. And then chest pain three quarters of the time, the other pain that uh, patients with dissection get is abdominal, and the other pain they get is in the back. And then a sharp pain, wide metastinum, et cetera, et cetera. On the bottom there, I want you to take a look at that. That's really important. A normal chest x-ray, normal chest x-ray is seen one out of six times. One out of six. We talked about classic, the 15%. This is essentially 15%. So one out of six of the times the chest x-ray is normal. You cannot use chest x-ray to rule out dissection. We talked a little bit, Dr. Matu talked about asymmetric blood pressures, how different should it be. Um, it is true that um, some patients with acute aortic dissection have asymmetric blood pressures. That's classified technically with no data at all, by the way. This is all expert opinion, no data. 15 millimeters of mercury different in each arms, but the problem is five to 10, even sometimes as high as 15% of patients who don't have dissection have that. And actually, the crazy part is, if you have asymmetric blood pressures, Totally, if you're asymptomatic, you're not there for dissection, but if you have asymmetric blood pressures at rest, your mortality is increased as a result of increased vascular disease, often coronary disease, just at baseline. So not only does it not really predict you for having dissection, but it may actually increase your risk for vascular disease in general and acute coronary syndrome, coronary disease in particular. So asymmetric blood pressures do not really help you in dissection. They don't, they don't do much, um, but they may portend a greater risk in the future for some kind of uh, peripheral vascular disease. 
uh, the futility of the chest x-ray. And I put that F there on purpose because of the whole one out of six thing. So we said before, chest x-ray normal, one out of six cases in acute aortic dissection. The findings are nonspecific. So chest x-ray, widened mediastinum, we see this a lot. It's a subjective quality. No one really knows what classifies widened mediastinum. In fact, radiologists have looked at this data and there's differing opinions on what counts as wide, especially on a PA and lateral, and what counts as wide in AP, and what uh, radiologist calls wide, and uh, what, what radiologist calls one with wide and one with not wide. Those are not classified for sure in the literature. They're not specifically studied uh, to prove that any particular width counts as wide. And then the other findings on chest x-ray are just not common enough to be useful in uh, the diagnosis, and certainly not in the rule out. So the moral of the story is this, because chest x-ray can miss one out of six dissections, if you think acute aortic dissection, you should be doing the CT, all right? So chest x-ray is useful for screening for it just to get a sense of, all right, is there something drastically obvious here? But if you actually think there's a dissection going on, chest x-ray is not enough. So what do you do if you can't get a CT scan? Renal insufficiency might cause that, so you're not sure. Do we, do, do we worry about the aorta? Do we worry about the kidney? What are we going to do if there's an IV dye allergy? So medical management is going to be pursued. You're not going to really be able to do the CT scan. And then can you do an MRI? Well, yeah, you can, but how many people have an MRI in their ED or very close by? Zero, two, three, four, five maybe. Not very many. Not very many. And then MRI, we know, takes a lot longer than CT. Are you going to send them away to MRI land and have them be, you know, unmonitored for that time? And then a TEE can be used instead of CT. But the problem with TEEs is that they're very difficult to get on short notice. You have to involve echo, you have to involve cardiology often, and then there's, of course, the sedation involved. So anesthesiology has to be involved unless you're doing the sedation yourself. These are difficult situations. Um, TTE, so transthoracic echocardiogram, is just not good enough to rule out dissection. I, I probably wouldn't even suggest doing this study at all. If someone says, oh, let's get an echo. Oh, well, what kind of echo? T transthoracic. Ah, this is not going to help me that much. A fast scan to look for pericardial fusion is actually better in this case than a transthoracic echo. So CT really is the test of choice here. If you can get a TEE, great. If you can send the patient over to MRI and it's not too far and it's easy to do, great. But CT is, is really the key. So this 54-year-old with chest pain. Now, this was John Ritter. Uh, John Ritter actually went into uh, an ED, uh, Providence St. Joseph in Southern California. I think it was in Burbank. Came, went in with chest pain and vomiting. Uh, EKGs were fine, markers were fine. Um, he did end up uh, getting admitted, um, but no one really picked up the fact that his chest pain wasn't getting any better, ended up getting worse and worse and worse, and finally uh, ended up suddenly dying. Sudden death, which is probably due to dissection leading to tamponade. When someone dies right away in dissection, sudden death, it's probably tamponade. And so that's what happened to John Ritter. Yes, there was a big malpractice case. Dr. Matu alluded to it. There was a big malpractice case, and it was failure to understand that patient's chest pain was not getting better. EKGs were not getting worse. There was no change in the EKGs. The markers were negative, and the dissection was, was the cause of his, his, uh, his death. So he has a big dissection foundation now, and actually his foundation helps support uh, diagnosis and, and um, consideration of the diagnosis for, for aortic dissection. So... All right, case number two, 77-year-old man with chest pain and syncope while on the toilet. You consider acute aortic dissection because you think, wow, chest pain, syncope, that's going to be bad. That's going to be probably pericardial tamponade. Something's going on here. So how often does dissection occur with patients with chest pain? What's the pathophys? What's the major classification? And why would you think of it in this case? And we talked about that a little bit. So it's uncommon, but it happens. Three out of a thousand patients with chest, back, or abdominal pain will end up having dissection. Now, how many of us have seen 80 MI cases in their career? 80. Few. How many of you guys, keep your hands up, how many of you have seen a dissection case? Yeah, right, good. So we're seeing it even more common than the 80 would suggest. Of course, that's statistics, one out of uh, every 80 on average. So um, the mean age is 62. It's rare under 40, but certain conditions predispose to it. Connective tissue disease, so as Dr. Matu mentioned, uh, Ehlers-Danlos 
Marfans, um, that kind of thing. Tertiary syphilis, not so commonly seen now, but there are comebacks of syphilis. And then cocaine use, which unfortunately, cocaine predisposes to everything related to chest pain, acute aortic dissection, MI, pneumothorax, pneumomediastinum, probably even reflux, actually, is my guess. So, um, but lots of stuff can be caused by cocaine, so don't do cocaine. Uh, and then family history matters. So the family history, especially of those who have connective di tissue diseases, if you have a family history of dissection, you do have a significantly higher risk. Um, so you always wonder what to put for family history on our charting when we're doing our documentation. And for chest pain, I like to put either diabetes or aortic dissection. I think the dissection thing really helps um, with, the, uh, with the documentation there. So. Okay, so pathophysiology. We've shown this slide already, already, but it's good to reinforce it. There's a tear in the tunica intima, which is the innermost layer of major uh, arteries. That tear then gets into the tunica media, which is the elastic layer of the wall of the artery of the aorta, and that allows blood to dissect between that those two layers of the tunica media, okay? So within the tunica media. Uh, a false lumen forms, and then you have an increase in the spread of that false lumen, so that gets bigger and bigger each instant the heart pumps and the blood pressure related to the, the blood uh, pumping out of the heart. So that is what gives rise to the fact that we need to control blood pressure and heart rate, because each time the heart pumps, more blood goes into that false lumen, and the, the strength of that pump and the tone of the blood vessel pours more blood into that false lumen, okay? Um, the classification scheme, so A for ascending, and this is great because the classification directly relates, relates to the management. A for ascending, so 62% of dissection cases are ascending, meaning they start proximal to the uh, arch and they, they come down towards the heart, they ascend towards the heart, uh, and those require surgery. That's a surgical diagnosis with uh, CT surgery. Uh, stand for B classification, B means not ascending. I put that very specifically. I didn't put descending because if someone is ascending and descending together, what type is that? A, that's A, okay? So B specifically means not ascending. It's not proximal to the arch, okay? And that requires medical therapy, cer certainly, but also uh, may require endovascular therapy. So it's not open surgery necessarily, um, but, it's, uh, but it, it can require uh, vascular, vascular surgery to help uh, stent stent that and or poke holes in the false lumen so that the blood drains back into the true lumen, okay? All right, so here's an illustration of that. The, uh, the true lumen is here. So this is the, the real aorta, and this is the false lumen right here, okay? True lumen here, false lumen here, all right? And you can see the false lumen is pushing in to the point where the crescent-shaped one, which is a smaller one, is the true lumen. That's bad. That means this is decompensation about to happen. Okay, and then why do they get syncope? We talked about this a little bit. You get pericardial tamponade. I showed you this picture because it gives you a really good illustration. If this is the ascending aorta right here, you can imagine a tear in this blood vessel. If this comes back up this way, all the way back, back, back into here, you can imagine that if that blood continues to tear through the aorta, it will end up in the pericardium here. And if it's in the pericardium, it's the rapidity at which the blood accumulates in the pericardium that causes the tamponade. It's not really the total amount of blood, because blood can be sitting there gradually accumulating, and your heart will compensate. But if blood comes suddenly, just like that, that's when you're going to get the tamponade physiology, and you're not going to be able to have any outflow from the left ventricle. Okay. So you're 77 year old with chest pain. I'm sure all you guys can recognize this guy, but this is King George II. This is the father of King George, the infamous King George III, who had some problems with some colonies a while ago. Um, but uh, King George II actually died of an aortic dissection. And the question is, how do we know that he died of a dissection? This is 1760 when he died. Here's the description of this. You tell me if you can, you can uh, agree that this is a dissection. On the 25th, this is, this is written by uh, one of his uh, staff members. On the 25th of October, he rose as usual at, at six, drank his chocolates, for all his actions were invariably methodic. A quarter after seven, he went into a little closet, his German valet de chambre, in waiting, heard a noise, ran, running in, found the king dead on the floor. The pericardium was found distended with a quantity of coagulated blood, nearly a pint. The whole heart was so compressed as to prevent any blood contained in the veins from being forced into the oracles meaning the atria. 
Therefore, the ventricles were found absolutely void of blood. In the trunk of the aorta, we found a transverse fissure on its inner side, about an inch and a half long, through which some blood had recently passed under its external coat and formed an elevated ecchymosis. And that is an incredible description of an aortic dissection in 1760 that tells you this is exactly what this guy died of. And the pericardium is what made him die. The pericardial tamponade is what made him die right away. So, all right. 77-year-old female, this is case number three, with chest pain. Sharp, non-radiating, the EKG chest x-ray troponin, all unremarkable, and the family members want a CT, all right? So you may not know this, but in emergency medicine and probably in primary care as well, we practice a second specialty. It's not our primary specialty, but this is our secondary, secondary specialty. It's called radiation psychiatry, and we practice it a lot. We try to avoid it. We only use it in certain circumstances, but we definitely use radiation as a way to uh, alleviate anxiety and, and uh, depression and sometimes psychosis, unfortunately. Um, so how do we avoid just getting a CT on absolutely everyone? I mean, you think it's a dissection, and they have sharp chest pain, they have severe chest pain. Anyone who has chest pain often complains of it as being the, you know, bad chest pain. So how do you not do a CT every single time to look for dissection? So here is where the D-dimer is very, very helpful, and more and more data has shown that actually if you use it with a structured clinical examination, you can actually help to rule out dissection and not do the CT. So this was a study done by Nazarian. This was the Aortic Dissection Detection, ADD study, and they add it to the, the D-dimer. And what this is is you look at three elements and you say the past medical history, does it have any of these high-risk features? The HPI, is it abrupt or severe? And is it tearing, ripping, uh, sharp, or stabbing? Uh, or is, uh, is there some problem with exam? Is there a significant pulse deficit? They actually put in here systolic blood pressure difference, a focal neuro deficit, an AI murmur, aortic insufficiency murmur, or is there shock? And what you find, or this was the, the study itself, which when you have zero of these findings, uh, prevalence of disease in the study was 6%, when you have one of them is 27%, greater than one, 39%. So when you have an ADD of zero and you do a D-dimer, so ADD of zero, which is none of these features, and you do a D-dimer and that's negative, it was 100% sensitive. Very, very good to help rule out, rule out aortic dissection. Now, a lot of these things will end up being positive, unfortunately, and so you're going to get an ADD of non-zero, and that's, that can be a problem. This was the uh, a, uh, latest data on it by the same author and showed that if you have chest pain, abdominal pain, or back pain, or syncope, or a pulse deficit, any one of those, plus acute aortic syndrome, that is dissection, is in your differential, the acute aortic syndrome uh, if, if the ADD is zero and the dimer is negative, they only missed one case in 294 patients. If the ADD is zero or one and the dimer is negative, you had one miss in 312 patients. And if the ADD is two plus and the dimer is negative, there were five misses in 113 patients. So the dimer is actually pretty darn good here. But if you get to an ADD, score of two or more, that's when your risk starts increasing unacceptably. Five misses in 113 patients, probably, probably too many. Um, but one miss in 312, it's like, boy, you know, if you're going to miss 0.3%, uh, that, as, as uh, Dr. Matu said, you can't catch all ACS cases, you can't catch all dissection cases, but that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good miss rate. Uh, pretty acceptable as far as I'm concerned. So if the ADD is zero or one, and I'll go back to it so you can see what it looks like here, past medical history, HPI, and exam, if that's zero or one with a negative dimer, it's useful to help strongly restratify against having an acute aortic dissection. There was a question here, sir. Uh, that's a great question. I don't believe in this study it was age-adjusted. I think it's reasonable to age-adjust it. Um, but I can't tell you for sure. I have to look that one up. I don't think it was, though, in that study. I don't think it was. So, yes? It uses the systolic blood pressure difference. You know, we talked about that. Not really yeah. That is a relic of the past. They just figured, well, everyone has said the systolic blood pressure thing might make a difference in the acute aortic dissection. Let's just throw that in there as a sensitivity piece so that people don't say later, well, if you just do the systolic blood pressure, you would have, you would have screened this person positive and they would have had uh, you know, a high risk uh, situation. So they put that in there, even including that bit, uh, the, uh, the, um, the ADD zero or one was, was, an acceptable, um, was an acceptable thing. So in, 
Yes, correct. A any, any, yeah, any difference. Yeah, uh, of 15 and greater. Yep, either one, either right, greater than left, or vice versa. Um, so the 77-year-old female with chest pain, that actually was Lucille Ball. Um, she uh, presented to the ED with sudden onset of chest pain. She was a heavy smoker, uh, presented to the ED with sudden onset of chest pain, ended up being diagnosed with an acute aortic dissection, um, and actually got uh, uh, treated for that, got surgery for that, everything was great, and then a few days later, unfortunately, ended up having a triple A as well, not related to the dissection, except in as much as she was a vascular path, but not related to the surgery of the, for the dissection. She actually had a triple A, and that's what, that's what uh, ultimately uh, uh, killed her. So, um, so anyways, this was a real case as well. So. Okay, last case, 97-year-old man, 97. 97-year-old man with chest pain, and you diagnose him with an acute aortic dissection. You're like, yeah, let's go ahead and do the scan. The kidney should be fine at age 97. Let's scan Stanford A, Stanford A dissection. She's like, we got to do surgery on this guy. So you consider surgical management. So what do you do in the meantime while you think about whether or not you're going to operate on a 97-year-old guy? So Stanford A, we said, was surgery. Stanford B was endovascular medical. While you're waiting for surgery, it is reasonable to go ahead and control the heart rate and the blood pressure, and you want to do those rapidly. In fact, this is probably the fastest that you will ever control the blood pressure and the heart rate. Probably the fastest. Uh, anticoagulation and fibrinol fibrinolysis are bad, of course. You don't want to anticoagulate these patients, right? That's really bad. And you should hold on heparin. Remember, you have a chest pain patient that's undifferentiated. If you consider acute aortic dissection, you should probably hold on heparin and not diagnose that patient with unstable angina until you've ruled out the dissection, if that's really high on your differential. So rapid blood pressure control, heart rate control. The goals are pretty aggressive, less than 60 for the heart rate, less than uh, 120 for so systolic blood pressure. I actually had a dissection patient last week in the ED uh, where his blood pressure is really hard to control and heart rate is really hard to control. And uh, they would clarify it again with the surgeon. You want me to be at 60 and 120? And he's like, yep, that's where I want it. So that's generally the rule. Is there really good data to say that that's the right number? No, there isn't. There's no data to say that, at least to my knowledge, to say that 60 is better than 50, is better than 70 for the heart rate, or systolic blood pressure 120 is better than 110, is better than 130. Um, no data to say that, but that's still expert opinion on where to go with it. So you can use a number of things, labetalol, nicardipine, hydralazine, esmolol, and nipride, nitroprusside if you want. Um, nitroprusside definitely works for the blood pressure. Um, there's no type of blood pressure that is non-responsive to nitroprusside. It's a pain to deal with with the light sensitivity and how they hook it up and stuff, but it does work. The one that I would avoid is nitroglycerin. And the reason you should probably avoid that is because it does cause a reflex tachycardia. So now you're fighting against the, the heart rate that's already probably in the 70s or 80s, if not higher, and now you're increasing the tachycardia from the nitroglycerin uh, reflex, and so you're, you're just adding to a, a problem that you don't want to deal with. So my, my drug of choice to start with is always a dose of labetalol right off the bat because it's usually easily uh, available, and then I'll add nicardipine to it, and if, uh, if the labetalol is not doing it for the heart rate, I might add esmolol. So, and you can add hydralazine too, that, that works as well. So, Good, semantics do matter. The, the term dissection versus aneurysm really, really does matter. I often hear dissecting aortic aneurysm and stuff like that. That's, that's not quite right. You shouldn't say that, and the reason you shouldn't say that is because management is different. Aneurysmal management, especially thoracic aortic uh, aneurysms as well as abdominal aortic aneurysms, you're not trying to lower the blood pressure. Their blood pressure is going to be low pretty soon if you're not careful, right? You don't want to mess with blood pressure lowering agents when you have a AAA. You uh, don't necessarily want to touch the heart rate when they have a AAA, right? You just want to sit there and hope they don't burst, get them typed and crossed, and get them to the OR. That's with a AAA, even a thoracic aortic aneurysm that's brand new. With a dissection, you definitely want to lower their blood pressure. You definitely want to lower their heart rate. It's very, very different, which is why don't, you, don't mix up those terms. Remember, dissection is within the wall, and aneurysm usually involves all the walls. There are some false aneurysms that, involve, that are within the wall, but um, the, the main aneurysm that we're talking about is, is through all the walls. So. All right, a couple quick uh, special cases. Can an MI and a dissection occur at the same time? 
Yes, yes they can. You can dissect back into the RCA. Uh, it's not that common, but it does happen. It does form a uh, right-sided uh, myocardial infarction, um, and it's really annoying to deal with because you've just diagnosed the STEMI, and you're like, yes, you're high-fiving, and you're sending them to the cath lab, and suddenly they end up with a dissection. Has anyone seen that? I, I've seen two in my career. I don't know if anyone's seen that. Yeah, it must be really irritating. So, all right. Uh, can a CTP protocol diagnose a dissection? Yes, it can. Not as well as a CT ortogram, but it definitely can. And the rule of thumb is, if you're worried about a PE and you're worried about a dissection, if you think one or the other is more common, obviously do that study. If you're not sure, do the PE study. Uh, because PE is better to look at dissection than the dissection study is better to look at the PE. Uh, PE is probably more common overall in general. Um, so there's a couple of reasons to do that. So. Can a dissection be painless? painless? We talked about that about 4% of the time, which is painful to us as caregivers. And then what's the downside of giving aspirin to a patient ultimately diagnosed with a dissection? So you have an ACS patient, you're going to give them aspirin, you give it to them almost by routine, and then, oh, lo and behold, they have a dissection, you diagnose it. Did you mess something up? The answer is probably not. Um, there's no data to suggest that giving one 324 dose or even 162 dose of aspirin uh, really has any, any poor outcomes in dissection. So I wouldn't worry about the aspirin thing. Heparin, on the other hand, bigger deal. And TP, on the other hand, forget about it. You're back in Dr. Matu's lecture. So, Okay, so this 97-year-old man with chest pain. So this guy is Dr. Michel Debarry, or Michael DeBakey. Um, he was a Lebanese-American, uh, born in the United States, um, considered to be the greatest uh, cardiac surgeon, at least in, in modern history. He's operated on, he had operated on, um, People like the Shah of Iran, King Hussein, LBJ, Kennedy, Boris Yeltsin, number of, number of people that, that, uh, who were his patients. Really famous guy. He developed the carotid endarterectomy, one of the first to do a cabbage. I mean, he did everything in cardiac surgery that, that we know about today. So 97 years old, uh, the, he, he uh, develops chest pain, uh, comes into the emergency room. I think this is in Houston. And um, he gets diagnosed with a Stanford A dissection. Uh, st type A, so it's surgery. Uh, so um, the, the doctors say, you know, you need to go to surgery. He's like, no, no, I'm not going to surgery. I'm 97. Don't operate on me. And they're like, no, no, you really need to go. And he's like, no, I'm not going. Then he starts getting more unresponsive to the point where he goes into a coma. So what do the doctors do? They know he doesn't, they don't want him to go to surgery, right? He doesn't want them to go to surgery. They decide, well, let's convene an ethics panel. So they do the ethics panel, which is the wrong answer on every single multiple choice test you ever take, right? The ethics panel. Oh, let's convene the ethics panel. Nope, nope, that's not right. Let's do the other thing. So they convene the ethics panel. They decide, yeah, we're going to take him to surgery. So they take him to surgery, right? So you can imagine the op note, like patient DeBakey. Diagnosis at the time, the classification was DeBakey classification. Procedure, DeBakey procedure, right? This guy who revolutionized the care of dissection is now getting operated on. He gets operated on, comes out of the coma, finally gets his health in order, because you can imagine post-op care for a 97-year-old guy with dissection, pretty rough. Anyways, after several months, he's fine. Practicing medicine up, up until age 99, at which point he then, uh, he then passed away. Un, un, unclear the cause that he passed away of at 99, but at that point, who cares, right? Um, but uh, this, uh, this amazing pioneer of, of cardiac surgery um, had the exact diagnosis, had the exact procedure uh, and, uh, uh, for which he was named. So uh, pretty amazing, pretty amazing person. And, and uh, there's a couple of high schools named after him, things like that. And uh, many of you heard, he's got also got some surgical tools as well. So pretty amazing. So, all right. So we talked about wrapping up. We talked about things we sh you should do after this talk. So teach someone the limits of chest x-ray. So one out of every six chest x-rays is normal in dissection. If you suspect acute aortic dissection, you should do a CT scan. You should teach someone the classification. Remember, Stanford A, ascending, surgery. Stanford B, not ascending, endovascular possible. So still maybe surgery, but definitely medical therapy uh, is at least uh, indicated. By the way, again, just to reiterate, uh, you should also start medical therapy for those who are going to go to surgery. That's just on route to surgery. Uh, why do you need to control the blood pressure and the heart rate? Well, again, each time you pump in the heart, you increase the shear force, send more blood into that false lumen. You don't want that to happen, so you reduce the number of beats and you reduce the blood pressure, the tone that would cause blood to be pushed into that false lumen. Uh, Libetalol 20 IV, nicardipine 5 IV an hour, it's reasonable places to start. 
And then the role of D-dimer. We talked about the ADD score. You can look that up. You don't need to memorize that. We can look that up and have it on there. Um, the dimer can help if that ADD score is a zero or one. A negative dimer can help rule out uh, aortic uh, dissection in that, in that case, or at least s radically minimize the possibility. So any questions at all? Great. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>